This is Anthony Zangrillo from the Motion Picture Club. I'm here with Kate Brooks, the director of uh, The Last Animals, and you have a very interesting background. Could you tell our audience how you came to this documentary? Sure. So I um, am a photojournalist and worked in complex zones for many, many years, basically after 9-11, relocated to the region and um, continuously worked in that part of the world. And in 2010, um, you know, I was doing a medevac in bed in Afghanistan and was in southern Afghanistan photographing um, double and triple amputees day in and day out. Finished that assignment, went on vacation, and um, was basically in the Masai Mara and saw elephants in the wild for the first time. And at the same time, I was trying to kind of process everything I had. So it was incredibly, you know, it was healing and also just made me realize that in spite of all the human destruction on the planet, there's still some natural order, mm -hmm. which really led to me wanting to help them in the way that I do, which is pick up my camera when I realized how bad the poaching crisis was. And um, it's such a powerful weapon using yes. that. You know, the camera is sometimes mightier. Yes, for sure. And. You know, with this with this project and with this film, um, you know, all the skills that I had as a, a photojournalist and particularly doing work in war zones so was was necessary for this work because the front lines of this issue are, you know, deadly and a war. And how did you come about choosing which topic specifically? That you knew this was the, you know, most urgent topic for you to discuss. Well, I, so I had this experience, right, that, that was sort of the sort of catalyst for me wanting to do um, work, environmental work, and work with wildlife. But you fast forward a couple of years later, you know, I was trying to figure out how to segue into doing that. I mean, it, was, it felt like a real departure from my, what I built as my career as a war photographer focusing on the Middle East. Um, I was a fellow at the University of Michigan, and I applied as a... Um, for the environment fellow, and um, got the fellowship. A few weeks into the fellowship, a department of the University of Michigan reached out to me and said, "You know, we've noticed your background, war photographer, um, and that you're the environment fellow. Perhaps you might consider looking at the connection between the ivory trade and terrorism, because we think that people are going to start drawing these connections." And that was a few months before Secretary Clinton began talking about the connections between the ivory trade and terrorism. And it immediately clicked, of course. That's what set me down this path. And there's a lot of discussions I have with my advisor at the time. You know, it would be a book, photo essay, it has to be a movie. I had um, Glass and Old is my directorial um, premiere. Debut, sorry, my directorial debut. Yeah. debut. <laughs> directorial <laughs> debut. Um, but it is <clears throat> it's the second film that I've worked on. I did a film. Um, as a, I worked as a contributing cinematographer on a film called The Boxing Girl of Cobble. Mm -hmm. um, oh my God, I don't know, five years ago. So you had some exposure before. Yeah, I mean, it's that, it was interesting because, you know, actually that first experience with the elephants in Kenya, along with Started do working on my first film project happened pretty much at the same time, mm -hmm. and that you know experience working on that film um, really sparked you know my love and passion for filmmaking. Well, I really you know, enjoyed this film when I heard about it. Uh, you know, coming to the Tribeca Film Festival was like a def definitely on my watch because so I'm in law school right now, and I know last year we had an event with the Art Law Society about the ivory trade, but. You know, when you get a presentation, even if you have lawyers come in and talk about it, it's not the same as seeing the imagery. And something that was really fascinating, because you mentioned the connection with terrorism, it's so, like, almost crazy how they did it. You know, they have the helicopters coming in and all that stuff. So did you know about this from that incident that you went to? Like, how in-depth they would go, to, like, the different, let's say, poachers? Um, you know, I mean, I would say in the course of making this film... What you know, I discovered, you know, in an incredible um, group, you know, an extraordinary group of people working around the world to 
do everything they can to, you know, save these animals and protect them. Um, but also a network of criminal activity that uh, was far more sinister than mm -hmm. I could have ever really imagined. That was something so powerful uh, in the documentary, right? It says, what is it? I think, believe you said you've lost faith in humanity at one point. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, that, I think that that goes back to saying some of what the things that I've seen in the course of being a you know war photographer and and also you know, in the course of my work um, and in the last few years, particularly after the Arab Spring started, and you know, losing a number of, of friends and colleagues in quick succession, and and also you know also just what happens to civilians in conflict. And at a certain point, you know, doing that type of work for for years on end, um, it's it's very difficult to understand how we can justify the human cost. And it's not even like it's not even justifying it. It's whether people even know it. Yeah. That's really the whole thing. That it's it feels like there is a whole like ignorance factor. And it's great to have films like these, you know, educate people and just let them be a part of the conversation is the biggest thing. Um, so what has been the biggest challenge in this new medium for you? Well, I know I'd say in, there are so many challenges with making this film, but it was a total education for me. I mean, I learned filmmaking from the start to, to finish. So, um, you know, steep learning curve um, a lot on a lot of different levels, but I think you know, at a practical level, um, the most challenging thing was a lot of the logistics, getting access, securing financing throughout, you know, making the film. It was, you know, an, it was an uphill struggle mm -hmm. at various times and throughout, you know, throughout the process. And it was a long project. I started it in the summer of 2013, and here we are since four years. Now, how do you, because your experience as a war photographer, like, to get a different emotion from a viewer, how are you able to turn those skills, right, into the moving image now? Was there a different mindset that you had to do, or was it the same principles? It's a different mindset, right, in that, you know, you're uh, trying to hold the moment. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then, of course, you know, thinking about how to cut a scene as well. So it's a different, it's, it's definitely a, a different creative process, but I think, you know, a lot um, has transferred over from my background in photography, whether, you know, it's my visual sensibility. Um, and also, you know, I think one of the things that I um, have, have been able to do in my photography is to take very complex geopolitical issues mm -hmm. and distill it down into human emotions that people understand in, in an image. And I think that's something that I've been able to bring um, still to, to motion picture. And I think in this film, you could definitely tell like the urgency factor is throughout the whole film, which is, you know, great to have that kind of uh, it's emotional beat in it. So uh, I really like your music choices within the film, and I think it also ties back into that. So could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So. Um, we had an amazing composer working on the film, uh, Paloma Estevez, and she did a, just an absolutely beautiful job. And it was very, very collaborative. Um, and then Emmanuel Jal did two songs for the film as well. One's a chant, and the other is a song called The Last Animal. It's in the dynamic end. And um, we are so incredibly of lucky to have him on board. I, we reached out to him because you know, he's originally from South Sudan and um, you know in the, in the film there's the issue of you know the, geographically it's the right sort of region of the world mm -hmm. and you know we're dealing with poachers who are coming across the border from South Sudan into the park in, um, in Congo and so reached out to him and um, you know, he just he cares about elephants, he cares about the cause, and 
set up a meeting, and it was the craziest thing, because I had an old friend of mine from Afghanistan who was in and out um, of L.A. during that time and was staying with me. Uh-huh. And she, one morning, I said, Tracy, do you want to put on some music? It was 8.30 in the morning. Yeah. So like, you look kind of manual doll. And she looks at me and she says, Kate, you know, I've been talking to you all this week with a musician friend of mine. But not my name, right? And uh, she's like, it's Manuel. And, I, and she's like, you're flying in today for a meeting. And I was like, yeah, I know, a meeting for me. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a crazy. Wow. It was really, we were both sitting there completely stunned. And we're like, what are the odds of that happening? I mean, it, it was um, bizarre. And, um, and he's just done a beautiful, beautiful job. And I, the, the, the chant gives me chills and the end credit song um, I think is motivating and inspiring and mm-hmm. has a call to act, inherent call to act. Which is what you want and it's like it ties everything together, which is the perfect thing, you know, in a movie to have the music be like that. Further the story, you know, um, and get those emotional beats. Uh, so, talk about being at the Tribeca Film Festival. Uh, it's been a whirlwind. It's a whirlwind <laughs> and it's been um, it's been incredible. I mean, I, I'm just so incredibly honored to have the film premiere here and on the Earth Day. It's a fabulous festival, and I just I can't I can't think of a better place to mm-hmm. be launching this film. I love that it's in New York and you know that it's accessible to people in the city, and um, yeah, I'm really excited. And what's the future plans for the film? Uh, we're starting our festival run, so I'm headed to Hot Docs in Toronto just after Tribeca. Oh wow, nice! And then out to Seattle for Seattle Film Festival and see. Going, going through the whole circuit, yeah. seeing everything like that. Starting to tour with a film. <laughs> well, I thought it was an excellent film, and I wish you the best of the success with it. Thank you so much. Thank you.